Today is Thursday, August 25th, 2022, and this is Mary Hilbertshauser for the David J. Sensor CDC Museum. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'll be interviewing Dr. Cornelia Davis through Zoom, and we'll be discussing her life and career, but especially focusing on her experience in the smallpox eradication program. Connie, thank you for being here. And do mm -hmm. I have your permission to interview and record this session? Mm -hmm. Yes, my name is Cornelia E. Davis, and um, you have my permission to record me. Thank you. Now, would you br briefly describe for me where you were born and the community that you grew up in? Yeah, well, I was born on the south side of Chicago to African-American parents. My dad was an orthopedic surgeon and my mom uh, was a teacher. And uh, I think ever since I was five, I knew I wanted to be a doctor. My mom encouraged that. Dad was more reticent because uh, he understood how, how difficult it was for African-American males to get into medical school, much less females. So um, when I was around 10, he told the family that he had been offered a job um, by Kaiser Hospital to go to California and that we were moving. And <laughs> so we were going from the south side of Chicago to Lily White Walnut Creek, suburb of Berkeley and Oakland um, in the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, so we we moved there. And um, I think as far as, you know, uh, what encouraged me to um, still to be a doctor, um, when I was about 11 or 12, Dr. Tom Dooley was giving a big lecture in San Francisco on his first book. And dad told me, you know, Connie, I worked with Dr. Dooley in Yokosuka, Japan. This is during the Korean War. So I'll try and get us, you know, backstage so you can meet. So I was really excited. And so we, we went there, and heard his presentation and got to go backstage. And of course, uh, uh, Dr. Dooley remembered dad and, and knew him. And so um, Dr. Dooley encouraged me, yes, you, you should go on and, and try uh, and be a doctor. On the other hand, I had a high school science teacher who told me, you know, your dad might be a doctor, but um, you're not smart enough, Connie. That pissed me off so that anytime the going would get tough, you know, even in university, I think of that teacher and I'd say, I'm going to show you, I'm going to do this, you know. So, you know, you have those that encourage you and those that don't. So, um, but he inspired you, yeah, right? Right, pushed me to go on. Mm -hmm. um, what year did you move out to Walnut Creek? It was 1956. Okay, 1956. It was still um a creek ran through the city and there were walnut groves there i mean walnut groves are no more <laughs> mm, yeah is there a creek probably not no they they after about five years you know it would always overflow so they made it go underground or something okay yeah i don't know you know okay now they wish they probably still had that creek i mean california's suffering <laughs> that is true Tell me a little bit about your um, educational path. So you had this teacher that inspired you, although not mm -hmm. that he thought he was inspiring you, but <laughs> he it was an inspiration for you to continue on to and continue and, doing yeah, it mm -hmm. regardless. So where did you go um, to your to college? To university? Yep, university. I went to Gonzaga University. It's in Spokane, Washington. It's uh, run by the Jesuit order. Um, and they had just started a Gonzaga and Florence, Italy program. My older brother had gone to the first year. 
and um, and I applied for sophomore year because I was in pre med, and by junior year you weren't you, you needed to be in the states and doing all these medical things. So they said the only opportunity is to go your sophomore year. And I went, my sophomore year was 1964, 65. And I mean, it was just so eye-opening. You know, in 1964 in the States, the Civil Rights Act was just passed. But African-Americans were really treated like second-class citizens, probably in the South, they still are. But um, but when I went to Europe, I mean, I, I was treated like my white uh, fellow classmates. And um, when I hitchhiked, because hitchhiking, we only went to school four days a week. And three days were for us to travel around. And the way that students travel in those days was you could hitchhike. And you, we had a woman had to hitchhike with a boy from, uh, from um, the university. But, you know, you could get up to Switzerland or over to Yugoslavia. And it was so enlightening to stay with people. A lot of times they invited us to stay, the ones who picked us up. Um, you know, to stay in their house. And, you know, I, I, I found out that um, I felt I was appreciated more in Europe than I had ever been in the States. And I thought, you know, Davis, you don't have to stay in the States to work. You, you could go overseas as long as you learn the language, you know, um, you aren't bound by staying in the States. So that, that thought, stayed in the back of my mind. And um, when I went to medical school, I was always looking for opportunities, you know, Mm -hmm. um, to, to get overseas again. Mm -hmm. And so then you went on to Berkeley. So, okay. I applied. um, I graduated in 1967 from Gonzaga. And I applied to UCSF School of Medicine, and I didn't get in. I was, I was devastated. I couldn't believe they didn't want me. Um, actually, I was really depressed, and I just, I said, I'm going up to the mountains. Uh, I got a job as a Girl Scout counselor at a camp. And my mom said, what are you going to do? I said, I, I just can't deal with this. <laughs> In the meantime, now this is where you need strong family support. My mom knew I needed to go on to graduate school. So she applied for me <laughs> to, to uh, go to Berkeley. and uh, But I had to take that uh, graduate record exam. So she sent a mail up to me a letter and said, you're signed up to take the GRE at in Colorado Springs. So you somehow get there. I mean, I didn't have a car or anything, but other counselors at camp lent me a car, told me how to get to Colorado. I took the exam. And then one of my older professors had said, look, when you go to graduate school, why don't you take anatomy? Because in the end, you're still you're going to have to know about it's not going to be wasted. You're going to have to know anatomy. So um, I took anatomy at Berkeley. And then the following year in 1968, I reapplied and I was accepted um, to UCSF School of Medicine. There were five African-Americans who were accepted in the freshman class. There were three males and two females. And I was one of the first two African-American females that had been accepted to UCSF. That was 1968. There were five women in the class of 110. So they got two for one with me, you know, a woman. But I'm just saying, I think now you have something like 48% of uh, medical school classes have women. But you can see how difficult it was just for women to get in, much less it took 
till 1968 for you know a black female to get into the medical school I think it's uh, well it just shows you what can I say mm -hmm. <laughs> okay and what were you what did you want to get out of that did you want to specialize in anything like infectious disease did you where did you want to where do you see yourself practicing well, I mean, and going through until you get on the wards, which is your last two years, you don't really know. But what I'm, I must say, um, UCSF, the professors there, um, they gave me a lot of ideas. And because, you know, because I told them I, I think I want to go overseas and do work. And so one was, why don't you apply? for a summer research grant at Hooper Foundation. And I got that, it was between my second and third year. And it allowed me to go and do this research project, which was to study um, the incidence of roundworm in the pediatric population on the pediatric ward and see if there was any difference between the three ethnic groups in Malaysia. So you have Malays, Chinese and Indians. So I was there for three months and did uh, research. Um, but that was so interesting to go. You know, now I'm traveling. When I went to Gonzaga and Florence, I mean, there were 80 students with me. I had to go alone to get to Malaysia and, um, you know, to find your way to Hooper Foundation, and um, just to fit in. Now, I must say, I was always, I, I had long hair. It didn't have this color here. Um, and so I was always there, taken for um, being Indian. So, uh, but, you know, I was, but I didn't dress like an Indian because it, over a certain age, you're always going to wear a sari, you know, so I was um, wearing Western clothes in, in Malaysia. Um, but, but that was um, a really interesting opportunity. The other opportunity that I got with UCSF was uh, one of my professors told me, he said, you want to go overseas? He said, well, the closest thing to a developing country in the States is an Indian reservation. So why don't you go to White River Apache Reservation in Arizona? And um, that'll be um, a really good experience. And I said, well, uh, in the middle of the desert, Arizona, I mean, uh, he said, no, no, White River is up in the White Mountains. It's really beautiful. So as I was driving there. That was in my fourth year of um, medical school externship, three months right before getting out to go to internship. Um, I thought he lied to me, you know, <laughs> I'm going through this desert and to where you come to turn off. And I thought I've been going since six in the morning. I'm going to go into this. I need to eat. So I go up to this restaurant and outside there's this, the sign, it's big, and it says, no dogs or Indians allowed. And I thought, what the shit? This is 1972. You can't have a sign like that. And then I thought, oh, damn, what are they going to think I am? I, mm -hmm. You know, if they don't want Indians, I can tell you they don't want Blacks. And then, so I thought, I am hungry. I'm going in here. So they're about five tables that were full. And I thought, okay, I better speak loudly. So the whole, you know, place can understand. So the waitress came up and I said, look, I'm a new doctor at the White River Reservation. So they could tell I'm not Indian. And can you tell me like, how much further do I have to go? Is it a good road? She said, None. you know, well, it depends on how fast you go, but it's paved road. It's a good road. You should get there between two and three hours. So I said, well, I better get something to eat. So how about a hamburger and fries? And uh, she said, yeah, coming right up. So she said, that your 
California plates? I said, yes, I'm coming from San Francisco, being posted there. So now everyone knows that um, I have a right to be going up and going. But I couldn't believe that you'd have a sign like that in 1972. But what happened here is they were doing a special public health um, research project, trying to see if mothers could um, make oral rehydration uh, salts the solution. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, all a number of these studies were being done around the world, but the Apache Reservation had been chosen. And uh, my supervisor had said, now, now look, you have to get the methodology right on, you know, it had to do with their chart number and all. And so then you cannot slip an IV into them. They, you have to show the mother how you prepare the solution. And I thought to myself, what kind of third class treatment are they giving these Indians? Because I'm coming from UC San Francisco. You had six hours in the emergency room to rehydrate a kid with moderate to severe diarrhea. You know, put a stick an IV in. In two hours, you can rehydrate them and send them home. And here we're mixing up this solution and then giving it to the child by um, by really? spoon from this uh, this uh, cup. And who would know that thirteen years later? I would open model ORT uh, training centers in Abidjan and in Monrovia, Liberia. I mean, it, and I did some of that initial research to prove that mothers could be trained to do that. It's just really small world. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, <laughs> it's crazy. So after you after you had the hamburger and fries, what what did the people in the area or in the restaurant? How did they react to you? So then it was like, oh, you know, she's a, a U U.S. Uh, public service, uh, you know. So we better not say anything. I mean, mm -hmm. she's commissioned officer, you know, because it was a public health um, hospital I was going to. Mm -hmm. So that's what I just wanted to have no problem and just mm -hmm. let me keep on going mm -hmm. you know um, you're, you're alone in a car and you're on the in the desert and there's not a lot around you so not a lot many, of emergency. many things could have happened on the way well through. yeah you know um I just thought let me keep on going up there I got my hamburger I can eat it I ate it there and then um you know went on up and then I have my supervisor there say, you know, he met me, I came in on like the weekend and they had some rooms in the back of the hospital for consultants and stuff. So that's where you were going to stay. And mm -hmm. there were two other young people, one, a nurse training, and then someone in radiology, mm -hmm. a guy. So you, we were about the same young, so you mm -hmm. could have people to play with on the weekend if you ever got out. But um, I remember him coming and, and explaining how the clinic is set up. And he said, you know, they've never had a woman doctor. So they get to choose who they want to see, which doctor, and they put their chart in back of your door. So, But don't get upset if they don't want to come to you. It's not, it's just they don't know a woman doctor. Darn, if everybody and his brother put the freaking chart in back. <laughs> you know, after an hour, I came out here, these two, you know, docs sitting there. I said, come on, talk to the people. We're never going to get out of here if you don't help on doing this. I mean, everyone wanted the lady epidemiologist and um and they could recognize that I did have Indian blood we uh, my family does mm -hmm. so um uh they loved that there was a, a woman doctor <laughs> there, mm -hmm. you know how long, how long were you there three months I was there three months long and enough to make um some not friends but you were able to be part of the community a little bit more Long enough to um, actually uh, became more of the, you know, I was there like Easter vacation, you know, high school students 
are sent away to a boarding school where they're not allowed to, to speak their native language. So all the kids were back, the high school kids were back. And while I was there, three teenagers climbed these cliffs and they had fallen and gotten, I mean, it was still up high um, and people had run into the, to the hospital and said, there these three boys, they're up there on the cliffs you need to get up there and, you know, so I, well, I didn't think any of the other doctors could go up the cliff, but as soon as I volunteered, I thought, there are no ropes, Connie, what the, why did you volunteer? Anyway, they took me away in the ambulance. I never even looked at the, the emergency kit because we're always in the hospital. I didn't even know what I had. And they were up what looked like a half a mile up this cliff. And I thought, but the men had climbed up two by two going up this cliff so that basically they just passed me up this cliff and then passed up my bag. And the three kids, I mean, they were, oh, my God, you know, the head split up. Uh, blood all over. They were breathing. I thought, oh, thank God. Thank God they're breathing. So I just started bandaging up their heads. They were all unconscious. And then let's get down, get them down the same way, get them in the uh, uh, ambulance. And then all the doctors and nurses were waiting for us to come. And so they were there to help really examine, put IVs in. And my supervisor pulled me aside and he said, I've already called for the um, flying doctors to come because they're going to need, <laughs> I mean, yeah, they for right. sure they had a hematomas and whatever. Um, so they're, they're going to be flown to Phoenix. The, the plane is coming out now, but the plane's not big you've got three passengers already and it can take one doctor. And he said, you know, you did, you did really good, Dr. Davis. So you're, you can go with them to Phoenix, you know? And I said, you know, Dr. Spivey, thank you. But, but here's the deal. They're going to look at me and they're going to know immediately that I'm a fourth year medical student. I don't know anything about what their benefits are. I'm not going to be able to tell some surgeon there that they have to do this operation. I said, their best bet is for you to get on that plane and for you to take them in because I, I don't know anything, the rules for the public health service. So he said, you're right. You're right. And I thought, and white male is going to trump everything, honey. You don't need me. I mean, they. I looked so young in those days. You know, I. You know, I still look young, um, but you know, I look like a teenager. And nobody's going to take Phoenix. Mm -hmm. They didn't know me from wherever. So anyway, but of course, the whole community heard that it was the lady doctor who went up mm -hmm. to save the boys and then they went they were in phoenix a long time i mean i had left but because they couldn't go into town and restaurants or bars uh, they had their own bar it was called the flaming arrow and you know we weren't told we couldn't go but None of the doctors went into this, but I wanted to see it one time before I left. So the day before I left, I went in the flaming arrow. And it was crowded, but everyone saw me. And um, the head of the tribe came over and said, we want to thank you again for saving the boys. And so they took and gave me drinks. And, but they remember, you know, mm -hmm. that it was the lady doctor who went up. To say wow boy. so you triage yeah. them on the side of a mountain wow yeah but they survived have you do you know what happened to them have you I don't know um you know I mean uh, I know they survived 
-hmm. and came back. My younger brother is um, a lawyer, and I don't know how he has gotten involved in helping um, the Indian tribes get certain things. But I know like during COVID time, um, he was trying to help them get um, the drugs to treat. And um, and he said, um, you know, Connie, um, they still say they were they, he'd say your sister was here in White River, uh, Apache, you know, and he's not even at White River, but they'll say, didn't your sister work in, in on an Indian reservation? He'd say, yeah, she was somewhere. He said, Apache. I mean, they still remember you wow. and what you did. So I thought, OK, yeah, no, I just haven't had time to. Mm -hmm drive back through the desert to see if that sign is still there mm, or that place on the crossroads. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. All right. So quite an interesting, I mean, Malaysia. So those were really, <laughs> you know, two things that kept on wetting yeah. my appetite to mm -hmm. do something overseas. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I did, um, I actually, um, went in and did a pediatric internship and residency and went down to USC LA County Hospital uh, to do my residency. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when I was finishing up, you know, I thought, okay, I'm not sure. I want to go back to the Bay Area, but not immediately. I want to do some kind of humanitarian thing for like six months only, do my bit for humanity. Mm -hmm. And so my uh, chief of peds uh, was busy writing reference letters, you know, to the ship hope, not that they would want my expert lack of expertise and Peace Corps. And then he called me in the ER um, and said, Connie, I just got a call from D.A. Henderson. He's <laughs> the head of smallpox in Geneva with WHO. And I said, we talked that WHO only takes experienced people. He said, yes, but they're looking for these junior doctors to go over to work on smallpox in India. And uh, of course he was asking for um, male doctors. Um, and and uh, so Dr. Worley told him, well, I'm writing these letters <coughs> for, Connie Davis, I mean, he said, you know, and DA said, you know how it is. We're sending them to isolated areas. These are areas that hadn't followed the methodology. There are no amenities. There are no hotels. There are no restaurants. He said, she's a woman. Do, do you think she can survive in this kind of situation? And he said, yes. And because he had worked in smallpox before, he knew exactly what he was telling, talking about. So when he called me, I said, well, what did you tell DA? And he said, I told him you could do it. I said, well, um, I don't have any problem with the no amenities. I mean, I'm a former Girl Scout. I got the highest badge equivalent to Eagle Badge with the Boy Scouts. But I don't know anything about smallpox. He said, don't worry about that. They're going to train you when you get there. They're going to be sending you a letter. You better start winding up here because you got to be first week in June, got to show up in Delhi. And um, and that's how I got that. How did Luke? Yeah. Opportunity. <laughs> you know, it was two men two white men who put their reputations on the line because the Indian program did not want a woman, mm -hmm. but yeah. they insisted. And so they took me under duress. I mean, I didn't know that until mm -hmm. I got there to mm -hmm. find out all the behind the scenes thing, but mm -hmm. they, they didn't, they were asking for male doctors, not a woman. And in hindsight, I can see their problem is that with the caste system, with sexism, are they even going to pay attention to a woman? 
Mm -hmm. you know. I mean, basically, I looked like I was 18, you know, and I was 26 to 27. And um, I mean, it's great when you got older, you don't look as old as you are. But then I looked really young. Mm -hmm. And um, so when we had one week orientation in Delhi, and where we were trained um, and taught about smallpox. There were nine men and Connie in this orientation. And they were already excited because the outbreaks in India were down to one digit outbreak. They used to have thousands of villages affected. And now and by June of 1975, they were just down to, you know, like 10 outbreaks left. So um, they had told us when they started on the first day that probably most of you are going to be sent to Bangladesh because Bangladesh is still having thousands of cases. And so um, Dr. Nicole Grasset was the regional smallpox uh, advisor. And she came in the beginning of the training to talk to each of us separately to find out, you know, did you have any um, where did you want to go or, you know, had you read up on any place that you thought you'd like to go? So when she met me, I said, look, they, they said that most of us are going to go to Bangladesh because you, you not, don't even have that many cases left. She said, Connie, we had so much trouble getting India to accept you. There is no, Bangladesh is fundamental Islam. There is, there's no way I'm even going to approach them because it's a no starter. I said, right now, she said, they want these doctors, they want to put them on these little boats to go up the stream because it's easier to get to those remote villages, mm -hmm. you know, once you get on the water. So you're going to be living on a boat with three to five men, is the captain going to take instructions from you? You know, they jump off the boat to um, take a bath. They pee over the side and other things. She said, it, it it's just not reasonable to think. So I, I thought, all right, I had plan B anyway in mind. I said, okay, I understand that. Bangladesh is a no-go. I said, but look, I know what you're going to do. You're going to send me to the capital of a state. I didn't come all this way to see chicken pox. And if I don't care where you send me in India, but I want you to send me to a rural area. I want to see the real India. Mm -hmm. Be careful what you wish for. Okay, <laughs> so I got to ask. May, may come true. <laughs> and that's the problem. And going to the rural area, I mean, the caste system is how they live, breathe, and work, you know. Ex and explain they, the caste system. Well, it, at it's that time. Hindu. Well, it's, Still, it's though, I... there it's they've got some rules to help affirmative action, but it's 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 still there. Um, in the Hindu religion, um, you are born in one of four major caste systems, and um, if or you're an untouchable, that's the fifth one. Um, so the highest is Brahmin and. They they have the sacred thread. They're the priest. Then there's the warrior. Then there's like the shopkeeper, merchant, independent. Then there's the worker bee, sudra. And then there's the outcast who does, cleans the toilets, cleans the rolls, uh, roads and stuff. So um, a highborn cannot even take water from another caste member i mean because he's he'll be polluted and then he has to go to the temple and go through all this purification uh, 
service. So now, what happens to people who are not Hindu or Muslim or don't believe in this? Well, you're outside the system, so that still makes you untouchable. Now, during the colonial times, when the British were in charge and they had their soldiers and all, the male British commander of you know the state, he was treated as if he was Brahmin, okay, because he was white male. Um, but basically, when I was, I, I was, um, well, they, they had a hard time convincing the Indian government to send me to the northern part of West Bengal. It's a very sensitive area for India because to the north is Tibet, to the east is Bhutan, to the west is Nepal. So it's a sensitive area because all these different nations are there. And at that time, even for tourists to go to Darjeeling, they could only get a one week pass. And, it, you know, you could only stay a one week. So now WHO is asking to put me up there for six weeks. And they saw my photo and they said, first of all, she looks, you're telling me she's American, but she looks Indian. And my hair was long. And um, as far as we're concerned, we think she, she's CIA. I, I said, CIA. Jesus, I sure hope CIA can pick somebody better than me to be. I don't know. I mean, you don't ask a lot of questions. I'm sure the CIA was doing something like putting listening satellites or something up there. I never asked. I didn't. But they did not want me to go because they thought I was CIA and because I looked Indian, once I got up there, I could blend in with the masses. They would not be able to follow me. So um, I had special restrictions that no other WHO doctor had. When I arrived to each new district, I was to go right to the police station and I should report that I'm arriving. If I let, whenever I left, no matter what time I needed to report back to the police station, I was going, leaving that district and going to the next one. When I got to that district, I go to the police station. And um, they said, we're sending out a poster with her picture on to all three districts saying, this is supposedly the WHO uh, <laughs> doctor, but we have suspicions. So you need to keep a lookout on her. Well, you know, Indian bureaucracy. I mean, you thought, I thought there is no way they're going to get this up there, that they're going to have alerted, you know, the governor and all these people. So when I did arrive and went immediately at Jaipaguri to the police station, I said, hi, I'm Dr. Davis. He said, yes, I know. And I said, uh, he said, I got a folder and he brought it out to show me. And there was my picture. And then in Hindi underneath was explaining that they needed to keep an eye on me. I couldn't believe that they did that. But, you know, I had 10, 12 hour days. I never knew where I was going to stay. So um, I actually after that first time in Jaipaiguri, I didn't have time to go and figure out where the one police station was in the whole district. So I let that, um, that wasn't high on my list of things to do. Mm -hmm. And one night in the dark bungalow at 11 o'clock at night, someone knocks on my door. Now I'm a single woman and everyone knows that. Who has the nerve to knock on my door? So I open it a little bit. And there's this guy, you know, and he pulls out this thing and flashes a badge like their CIA mm -hmm. <laughs> equivalent. 
He said, your doctor, Cornelia Davis? I said, yes. He said, you did not go. You have not been going to the police station. I said, did you see what time it is? I said, I've been out for 12 hours today. I'm tired. I, yeah, you're right. I didn't go. And everyone knows I'm the only one with this Toyota Land Cruiser, only one in three districts. It's parked downstairs right under my window. I said, I, you know, I I'm, haven't gone anywhere. And do you know what time it is? How dare you knock on my door at 11 o'clock at night? He said, you need to go to the police station. I said, I'll go tomorrow morning, okay? And I closed the door. And then the next day with my staff, I said, I'm not going to the police station. We were in Cooch Bihar. Let's go, take me to the governor's palace. I'm gonna speak to the top person. So we go in, I go in alone and I introduce myself and he says, I, I know who you are, Dr. Davis. Um, I said, look, last night at 11, this guy from your secret service knocked on the door saying I hadn't gone to the police station. I said, I have 12 hour days. I said, can't you send out another circular saying she's just doing her job. Let her do her job. She doesn't have to do this. I said, everybody knows the lady epidemiologist and my car. They know when I go, get out of the car to pee. So please, come on. He laughed and he said, I'll send out a circular to tell him, forget it, to stop bothering you about checking in. But do you know that they, they collected all my letters home for the first five weeks and I, my, my parents hadn't gotten any letters. And I always sent a letter when I'm overseas. I would write a letter once a week because it just, it lets them know what you're doing. You're alive. They don't worry about you. Mm -hmm. And they hadn't gotten one since I arrived in India and it was during the emergency time. And, um, and so that's when my mother called D.A. Henderson in Geneva saying, my daughter, where is she? you know, did she arrive? Uh, we haven't gotten any word. And um, that's when for our first meeting, uh, when they called us down after a month, the junior epidemiologist, um, the regional epidemiologist said, who's Dr. Davis? And I said, I am. He said, right home. Your mother called D.A. Henderson. I thought I wanted to die. And all the guys were saying, call home, Connie. Your mom's worried about you, <laughs> you know. And then uh, I got a letter from mom that said she got five letters in a row. And when she opened them, it was clearly been opened and taped back. Anytime I mentioned a name of a village, They'd taken a black marker and gone through it. But do you know, how, how do you know where I'm ma mailing these letters? I mean, it started from Delhi and then I could mail them at any post office in Cooch Bihar. So you had to have thousands of people looking for Connie Davis's letters. Then you read through. And I guess they finally realized this is no CIA report, <laughs> you know. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't believe that they went to all that trouble, mm -hmm. but um, because I was like, you had a Jeep, you had a, a driver and a paramedic nurse. So they were both male. My driver was a Muslim. My um, nurse was Hindu. They could not eat together. I, as an unrelated female, could not technically, according to the caste rules, eat with them. So after a week of us traveling like this, when we were going back to the dock bungalow, I told him, look, I have spoken to the gods and they are in agreement. If 
there is any bad karma associated with what I'm going to tell you. I have accepted to take it off. But we all three are going to be eating together. You know, we're going to go to uh, those stop truck stops places where they have the big picnic tables, eight at a men at a table. I said, you're not going to let any other men sit with us, but we're going to eat there. We're going to eat together. And I realized you two don't usually eat. You're not supposed to eat with me. But we're already breaking the rules because we're in the same vehicle together. So I'm ordering you that you I, you didn't have any choice. You didn't volunteer to work for the expat doctor. So if there's any bad karma, I've accepted to take it off. So you're not going to have any bad karma associated. I actually thought as soon as we got back to Cooch Bihar, they'd go and report me to the chief THO because this was like, how can you, you know, and at first it, it took a couple of days for them to relax, to, you know, be able to enjoy the meal. But then, you know, we were a team and I said, here, you're my family here. You're all I got. And they really were very protective of me, mm -hmm. you know? So um, can you, can you tell me about like a typical day when you guys would go out, all three of you? Yeah. Well, we, because it was so hot and humid on the lowlands, not Darjeeling, you know, I'd wake up at five because I wanted to see the third highest mountain, Kachinjunga. And you had to do it as monsoon season. So before the clouds gathered, you needed to get a quick glimpse. And then there's just a hint of coolness before seven. <laughs> and then it just is muggy and dry. And so um, I knew that we weren't getting any reports of cases. So my concern, and I'd read the reports of West Bengal before leaving, was that I had a 160 kilometer border with Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. I knew they were having thousands of cases. We aren't reporting any. And two years previous, West Bengal had gotten down to like no cases. And then cases from Bangladesh should come in and reintroduce smallpox. So that was going to be my worry. Mm -hmm. So I was going to go along border villages to see what was going on, to see if there were any rash and fever cases. So you'd get up early in the morning and then we had the rail, the map, uh, road map. And so I didn't know where I wanted to go, but I would just close my eyes and see where my finger hit. And um, it would hit on a border town. And I'd say, you know, I've heard of this village. And the driver would say, yeah, I, I can get there. You know, I said, well, let, let's go there. Um, if I've already been in that district. Um, I mean, they've all met me before. When I got off the plane, I was taken. They'd called all the smallpox workers so that they could see me and know. But were they surprised? They were not expecting a woman. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, the epidemiologist I was replacing, he, he didn't he didn't even look at me. He was looking for an older, experienced white male and mm -hmm. I didn't fit the bill. And the next thing I knew, I was outside on the <laughs> outside of the airport looking, trying to find the Jeep. And when, uh, when, when you arrived and you arrived with all those other um doctors were all those american doctors or were they no they were um mostly european there was okay. one other american doctor um but um they they were european doctors and they all went to to bangladesh mm -hmm. and we crying because i wasn't going with them you know mm -hmm. um, so um what was I saying? I was telling you were you replacing an epidemiologist. Yes, right. And he, um, he, you know, and I had um, actually, you always go to the capital of the state and you go into the smallpox program so that they know who you are. Mm -hmm. You're newly trained. So they know you don't know that much about smallpox. And then you go up to your assignment. But because I was trying to overlap with him, he was leaving in a week. 
So um, they had told, um, I had gone to Lucknow first to get field training with Don Francis, uh, who was a CDC person that was mm -hmm. based there. And they said, um, he said, your plans have changed, Connie. You're to go right away, uh, fly to Calcutta. We're working on your plane ticket and go right, stay in the airport, continue right up to Jaipaiguri. Don't go into the office because you have to overlap. And um, so I was sitting in the airport when David Heyman, he was working out of Calcutta. Um, he came into the departure lounge. How do you get to come into the departure lounge? I mean, things have really changed a lot. Mm -hmm. So he um, he didn't know me either, but he, he came in front of me and he said, are you Dr. Davis? You know, and I wanted to say, well, who wants to know? But I said, yes, I am. He said, great, come in the back here. He said, there are no banks up where you're going. So we have no way of getting money to you, you know, to for your per diem, for you to pay for petrol for your cars or others. So I have money right here in this little suitcase for you. So we have to go to the back. I have to count out. Uh, the money, and then you're going to count, and then you're going to sign this chit saying you you received this much. It was five thousand dollars in ten rupee notes. I said, "Are you crazy? You're going to count this money in the back of the departure lounge?" I, he said, "We don't have much time, Connie, before your plane takes off." So um, we got behind this huge pillar. And I stood in front of him, you know, hoping no one would come back here, seeing him counting these 10 rupee notes. I think it was 28,000, whatever. And they said, okay, now it's your turn. I, I haven't squatted on my haunches since I was five years old. So I'm counting this. So then I make the chit. And I said, how am I supposed to get on this plane? They're going to ask me to open this up. And here's all this money. He said, okay. They may or may not ask you to open it. It's, you, you know, it's up to them. Sometimes they don't. And if you open it, you just tell them, I'm WHO and this is WHO money and I'm taking it with me. And you show them your laissez passe and, you know, like, forget it. They actually didn't ask me to open that satchel, you know, mm -hmm. but I said, uh, you said there are no banks. What am I supposed to do with this money? He said, well, in the daytime, you can keep it under the front seat, you know, and at night you can put it under your pillow and have sweet drinks. I said, all right, fine. You know, so, um, so I'm taking this, I'm carrying this money, which to me is like a lot of money. And if anyone knows, they're going to kill me so they can have these rupees. Um, it's, anyway, they had just opened a bank, actually, in Jaipaiguri that I could put the money in and take half with me. But I still had to carry a lot because you didn't know when you'd get back to this bank to get more money. But um, Did you on use my, the money to pay your people and also for petrol? Well, or? the money, one, was to pay my per diem mm -hmm. every day so I could eat lodging pay for, I, they knew I would have my own vehicle. So I needed to go be able to go to any gas station and pay for the petrol. But if you actually have an outbreak, you need to pay for smallpox workers. Mm -hmm. You need, you know, you need money to pay for so many things. And actually West Bengal had not paid their smallpox workers for three to six months. And I thought, well, first of all, I can tell you why they may not be working. If I haven't been paid for six months, I'm not going to be so enthusiastic. But actually, the smallpox workers were so loyal to, they were working. And then when I finally told my team that we were going to eat together, the per diem for me was enough. I could pay for their meals too, you know. And wherever I stayed in official DAC, DAC, D-A-K is the male bun bungalows that were scattered a horseback rides mm -hmm. day apart. 
And so you had no way to alert them in advance. Usually they had one or two rooms. You needed to get off the road by 4 p.m. Because in West Bengal, they really did have a problem with dacoits, with bandits. And so if the dacoits didn't get you, hitting a cow would certainly uh, mess your vehicle up too. So you need it before the sun set. You need it to find a dock bungalow. Now your driver usually knew where all of them were, but you needed to get in before four so that if there were several people who wanted this lodging, uh, that you could get it, you know. Um, and it's um, and the dock bungalow was 10 rupees for the WHO person. And if there was room for the officer, then somewhere in the back, there was always room for your driver and paramedic for, for them to stay. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. It's only uh, one time that I got in late and it was a place that had actually like three rooms, but they were all taken. And uh, that's when I played the woman card <laughs> when I came and I said, are all the rooms taken? And um, one of them came forward and said, you can have my room. I'll move in with one of the other men. I said, I'm only staying one night. Thank you very much. I I'm moving on because you mm -hmm. never knew where the rumor was. You get a rumor of rash and fever. You try and determine, are they, did you see it? Did you see this rash? Did it look like this? You know, do you know where this village is? Yeah, it's just the one next to mine. Are you willing then to get in my car and go with me to show? Yes. But I gave an award just for reporting a rash and fever was 100 rupees. So there were a lot of people that were coming up to the vehicle to say, ah, there's a rash and fever case here. So you had to determine who sounded like they knew what they were talking about. And then uh, you go off to the village. So you never knew where you were going to stay that night. You know, that first six months was was really hard. And you had identification cards to show them like what it looked like if it was. There was um, like a big postcard. Mm -hmm. And on the front was a um, nine month old male baby. And it showed the front of him with full smallpox pustules and the back of him. So it, it, so you knew, you know, did this rash look like this, you know, that you're trying to get at? And it was it was a good picture. I mean, mm -hmm. people used to pull that and look at it, study, you know, mm -hmm. until we came to the village after a week and our first house, I said, have you seen anyone with a rash and fever like this? And he looked at this and he said, I haven't seen it, but I heard that there's a rash and fever case. You know, and I turned to my nurse and I said, he's not understanding my poor Hindi. I'm sure because we'd always gotten no, 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 we haven't seen, heard anything. I said, ask him in real Hindi, <laughs> what? And he said, no, it's in a village that way. Mm -hmm. And I looked, it's South, it's Bangladesh, you know, and uh, they made it absolutely clear. You are not to cross international borders, mm -hmm. you know, but it's, really close, which would be within, if in fact, the case is just across the border, it's within my one kilometer, which means it's going to happen like it did two years ago, that cases will be re-entered into West Bengal. And you know who they're going to blame? See, I told you, <laughs> I told you not to send a woman up there. And She's a black woman and she's American. I told you that bad idea. So I thought, oh God, I could just pretend, well, let's say it's chickenpox. You don't do anything about that. Mm 
But what if it is smallpox? What if someone from the family comes over to get something on this side? So I said, is there a health clinic close by? He said, yeah, about half a kilometer. I said, let's go there and hear if they'd heard anything. And we talked to the doctor. He'd had no cases. He hadn't seen anything in six months, a year. And I said, we heard a, a rumor that there's, there's a case of ration fever. Tell him uh, what the name of this village is. He said, yeah, I heard it. I said, well, what did you do? He said, it's in Bangladesh, Dr. Davis. I said, oh, oh, yeah, right. Okay. So then I left and I thought, let, let me just think about this. And then I told my team, I said, look, I have a laissez passe. I'm just going to sneak across the border. I'm going to take a look, quick look, and then I'm come back. If it's chicken pox, we can all just relax. If it's smallpox, we're going to have to do containment. And the nurse said, uh, Dr. Davis, you speak Bengali? <laughs> I said, I don't even speak Hindi that well. And the driver said, we're not letting you go alone. We're going to go with you. We three looked so different. S sneaking in, walking across the right. I, I mean, like, if you wanted to, pay, to cause attention, here are three un clearly unrelated people that are coming. And I told them, I said, okay, as we're walking there, I said, let's, I'm not going to speak because for sure they're going to see I'm a foreigner. So, uh, Dinesh, you you talk to them and ask where this village is. You're not asking why you want to go. We just want to go, and then we'll get a, a bullet cart or something to take us there. So we went across, and uh, we climbed into this bullet cart and got to this village and jumped out. And, of course, I mean, they don't get too many foreigners, you know, the villagers around us. And I said, I need to speak to your chief. Chief was coming and I said, I heard a rumor that you have smallpox case here in the village. Is that true? And he said, yes, we have smallpox. You do? I said, C can I see it? So we went to the house. They were in seclusion. Um, it was uh, parents with six kids and they'd all gone through. There were just the last two that had an active you know, pustules, scabs, you know, and I, that was my first cases of smallpox scene. I asked him, can I, can I, well, first I told the chief, I'm WHO and I'm in India, but I heard you're really close to us. So I just needed to make sure, have they been across to India? No, I said, is anyone in your village, you know, but I'm not believing where did you go? How did you get this? They've gone to a wedding. I said, have you told your Tana district people about this case? He said he hadn't. I said, you have to go today after we leave and, and report these cases because the team has to come and then go to where that village was, you know, to start doing containment and stuff and also to vaccinate around here. I said, but I, I need, I'm WHO, I need to go across, get across the border again and start doing containment on my side, mm -hmm. you know? And so when we got back, first thing I thought, well, I had collected scabs. So, and I filled out the form, mm -hmm. and name of the village and yada, 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 yada. So I had that with me. So we have to find the telegram. Right. Telegraph. I was going to ask you about communication. What was yeah, communication? That's the like? first thing we had smallpox. So I went to the telegraph office and I said, can I have the form uh, for a telegram? He said, I'll do it. I said, I know how to write and to speak English. Give me the form. You know, there, it was crowded. There are a lot of people in there. I really didn't want to be saying something out loud so others would hear about smallpox mm -hmm. he did not like that this woman anyway he thrust this piece of paper at me and I wrote eight cases smallpox 
village so-and-so, district so-and-so. And then I thought, oh, shit, I have to say Bangladesh. I'm going to be in deep kimchi. I mean, Calcutta hasn't even seen me. All they're going to see is, this is from Dr. Cornelia Davis. We don't even know if she can recognize smallpox. And, she, and what's she doing in Bangladesh? I said, oh, I am in real trouble. So but anyway, I finished it. And he takes it because he has to figure out how much I owe. And he reads this out loud. Eight cases, smallpox in village. And I thought, I want to kill you. And I thought, all of Kuch Bihar will know tonight about this. And that, I went to Bangladesh. And I came back. Um, I, so we got that out, uh, the telegram off. Then I went to take me back to the village. We need to start getting prepared. The driver, you need to go to the district health office and you need to get a smallpox worker and smallpox right now. It's the afternoon, but we have to get started. I'm going to stay here and talk to the village, tell them what I found start enumerating everyone in each house so that when the smallpox worker comes, he can go really fast. Also looking at the time, I need to be off the border, um, you know, before six. Um, so, you know, I, I talked to the village, well, with translation from my nurse. And I say, does anyone here speak any and write any other language? I, I don't care what it is. You know, yes, uh, Hindi. So I said, okay, will you help us? Because I need you. Here's the paper. We're going to go house to house. I'm going to put a number on it so that when the smallpox worker comes, he can easily see there's nine people here. So he can just check them off and make sure he gets every one of them. You know, and then I talked to them. Are there any mothers here who have children, babies under two? I said, I know you're really anxious. You don't want the baby to get anything, but I, they need to get vaccinated. I will come to you each separately. I'll examine the child, make sure he's healthy. It's, you know, I assure you, you know, when the smallpox worker came back, you know, I showed them it doesn't hurt, you know, vaccinate me on this arm to show, you know, and I tease the men, did I cry? And I'm a woman. Are you afraid to get a vaccination? And they would laugh and the women would laugh. So everyone is agreeable. Nobody's going to refuse. So I said, we need to start getting working. So, um, you know, 5.30, I needed to leave. Um, and they were still doing enumeration. And the smallpox worker was staying the night there. They were putting him up. And there were three villages. He the driver also brought back the maps from the DHO. There were three villages that were on the border and that were within the one kilometer that I'm using to um, determine. In one kilometer from a case, you have to vaccinate everybody. Mm -hmm. In 10 kilometers, you have to just search for rash and fever. So then I had to see how many other villages we need to do the search in and then I figured, okay, the plane only comes up once a week. It's on Saturday. This is Wednesday. I have three days to get all of these villages searched, vaccinated, fever and rash and fever cases looked at. And then before I said, I knew they were going to send someone from Calcutta because this woman is crazy. <laughs> you know, and I'm going to be in deep kimchi. So I might as well do everything correct. And then when we got to the end of the day, it was so hot. I told, I was staying at a mission, a Jesuit mission. And I told the priest, I said, I'm going up to Darjeeling. I, I just have to get two days of cool air. I will be back here on Monday before seven. I said, I know that someone's coming from Calcutta. Would you please put them up? Yes, he will. He said, and I will be here before seven and to meet them, you know. And sure enough, when I came down at quarter of seven, pulled into the uh, parking lot, 
Father Laferla came out and he said, there's someone here, a doctor from Calcutta, from WHO. Um, he's been, he, he, uh, his car drove up, uh, got him on Saturday. Um, he went with uh, the district health officer to, uh, to, to the border to see um, the villages. He said, he's in eating lunch, uh, eating breakfast. I told him you're coming. So he'd given me a heads up. So I knew. So I came in and sat down and said, hi, I'm Dr. Davis. And he introduced himself. And he said, um, you know, the district health officer took me to the border. Um, he told me that he had found the cases in Bangladesh. I said, what? I said, he, he hasn't even been to the border when I was doing this. He said, Tom Twa. <laughs> he said, when I went to the border village, and I got there. Well, of course, all the village came out and they said, um, well, they knew who the district health. He said, yes, the lady epidemiologist is the one who was here with us, who told us about the cases in Bangladesh, who, you know, took the names vaccinated and all. It was the lady epidemiologist who did that. So he said, we know this DHO. He, he is nefarious. So, and besides, it was your name on the telegram. So we knew it was you. He said, job well done. I was waiting to get chewed out about you're coming back to Calcutta now because you don't know about not crossing international borders. He said, you did a great job. Who oh, was the person that came up from Calcutta? I don't know. It was a European. Yeah, uh, okay. Um, and... Um, but um, older, experienced, mm -hmm. wise, seeing thousands of cases and said, um, you did good. How did you, you know? feel about that? I did. I was I was worried about crossing, but mm -hmm. I was even more worried about cases being reentered, you know, mm -hmm. reintroducing smallpox into our side and being blamed for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes. Well, yeah. yeah, I love it was it was good. And, you know, I searched diligently for two years. I never saw another batch of smallpox cases. Wait, I thought of you were only supposed to be there six months. Oh, well, what yes. What happened there? No. <laughs> I did so well <laughs> in my six months up country because most doctors, junior doctors, you only had one district. I had three districts. I really, I put lookouts, vaccinators. I paid along the border at where I saw major, you know, the border was not marked and it didn't have a wall. There was only one official crossing there. I kept a, um, a vaccinator all the time. Anyone coming in, I told immigration, they had to get that. I don't want to see whether or not they had a vaccination before. Don't let them in unless they're vaccinated. But then there are all these people that, you know, are coming across the border at other places. So I'd go to the village. I'd see who looked like he had some brains and I'd hire him as a smallpox worker and put him um, and I'd say at night is when I need you to work. I need you to just tell, we don't need names. I just need you to keep a record of how many uh, people you're vaccinating so I can get an idea at the end of the month. I, I can come at any time to check your work and then I'll pay you when I come. So I had like six or eight people along the border who were just vaccinating people coming in from Bangladesh, because I really, 180 kilometers, I, I really worried about smallpox being reintroduced. So um, so the Bangladesh president was assassinated um, after I was there for about two months. And um, of course, I didn't hear anything at all about it. But uh, of course, the US embassy in Delhi had heard about it in advance. And they called up the UN agencies and asked, are there any Americans that are up on the border with Bangladesh? 
because quietly the president's been assassinated. They're going to say that it's India that's assassinated them. And there's probably going to be war and you need to get any American out. Well, apparently I was the only American way up there surrounded on three sides by Bangladesh. And they said, you, you get her out, you get her out immediately. That's your problem. You need to get her and bring her down. You know, so I came back late one night and there was this guy at my doorstep waiting for me. And uh, he had three letters. One was explaining him that he his job was to find me. And I always told the district health officer this week, I'm going to be in this area, you know, so they kind of knew where I was. So he was what he knew I was going to be coming back that night. And then he said, you need to open up those others. And the other one was a letter to the highest armed forces. This is, um, you are not to take Dr. Davis's vehicle. You are to give her all aid and help and helping her get down to Calcutta. Other one was to the police commissioner. You are not to take her vehicle, you know, because they were expecting war. Mm -hmm. And he told the guy who came up with these letters, he said, they told me no matter what time it is, you're to leave, you're to leave immediately from here. I said, it's already 11 o'clock at night. He said this. So I said, go down and get my, my staff. They came up. I let them see the letters. I said, we're, we're going, to, we never were out on the road at, after dark. Mm -hmm. I said, we have to get at least we have to go and get to Jaipaiguri so I can get where my, my, um, I, I had a duffel bag and stuff, pick that up. It's on the way down to Calcutta. And so, um, I, and I told the driver, go and find out where the gas station guy lives. You got to wake him up, fill the car up all the way with petrol, um, we're leaving tonight. I asked him, are you supposed to come with us? He said, no, you're to travel uh, alone. And he said, you're not to tell anyone. You're just to leave. Well, even though I didn't like the DHO, you know, it's hard. You just disappear. What, what if they worry? Did you get in a car accident or what? So mm -hmm. I wrote this letter. I just said, I've been ordered to come to Calcutta. It was late at night. So I told your Chokadar, your, don't wake you up. He's to give you the letter in the morning. So then I told him, don't wake him up. In the morning, you give him this letter. And so then we took off. We arrived like two in the morning to the mission. And um, Father Lefer, I mean, he had come down because the gates never open. I mean, mm -hmm who is coming at this time of night? And he sees me and he says, come into my office. I said, please don't get angry at me. Read these letters that I had. And he said, uh, his buddy was the head of the armed forces. They would be drinking buddies, actually. Um, he said, I, I just saw the guy uh, tonight. He said, they had heard about the assassination and they were given explicit orders. They were not to cross the border. But if Bangladesh soldiers came, they were to repel them. So they were getting all ready and set up for being attacked. Mm -hmm. So he said, I understand why um, the WHO wants to get you out. I said, well, um, he said, you know, it's two o'clock in the morning already. Um your, send your guy now to get some more petrol here. I'll wake you at five in the morning. If you start, you should by eight hours be able to get to Calcutta going straight. So at least you can get a little bit of rest. I'll have the, uh, the cook make you something, a meal before you go. I'll see you off. You know, and it felt like, so, you know, will we ever be back up here? What? What's going to happen? Are we going to have war? Mm -hmm. So anyway, we're, we leave at five and we're driving down and somewhere halfway to Calcutta, 
we hear this honking, you know, and we look and I say, it's a smallpox Jeep. So we pulled to the side and there was um, another smallpox, uh, you know, he's from Sweden or someplace. And he said, what, what are you doing here? I said, did you get notice? He said, notice, notice about what? I said, the Bangladeshi president's been killed. I, I was called to come down, um, you know, to, to Calcutta. He said, I haven't heard anything. I'll, I'll see, go back and see if anything is on the radio or whatever. I said, well, I have to keep on going because, you know, and so, I mean, we hadn't even been, I hadn't been to Calcutta. My driver had never been to Calcutta. We didn't know where WHO was. I know, but they're really good at asking questions. And anyway, we get in around, I don't know, 11 in the morning and um, go right in. And WHO's really happy to see me. And, um, and I said, and they said, you better go right away to um, the embassy. I said, what, what embassy? He looks at me like your embassy, the American consulate, you better go. I said, well, should I go and get shout? Go now. <laughs> you know? So take your pass, your American passport with you. So uh, I thought, let me take a taxi because these people don't know where it is. And so, the, you know, the guard out, I show him my American passport. I come in to the Marine Guard and he says, they've been waiting for you, calls up. Dr. Davis with WHO, she's here. So I called up to the counselor general. He said, I just want to call the political officer in. So they all wanted to know what was going on. Had I heard, I said, I hadn't heard anything until WHO had sent this guy up with these letters for me. I said, but I started at five in the morning. And there were all these big army trucks that were heading up to the major post there, you know, filled with soldiers and all. After I counted 150, I got tired and um, I, I stopped, you know, but they were getting ready, you know, that they expected to be uh, attacked. I said, but Father Laferla, who's buddies with the guy, said that the orders for the Indian side was they were not to go and attack. They were just to stay on the Indian side, repel them if they come. So I said, that's all I know, <laughs> you know, I, you know. Uh, but there were lots of troops and stuff going up there. Wow. And then, you know, the last two months, I had to stay in Calcutta. My team went back with the, the car. And I said, I have all these vaccinators that need to be paid. I, I said, I can't leave them. He said, your staff know, and we're sending money for, you know, I had told them that we're sending money so they can go and pay them along. I said, cause that's how you stiff all these people. <laughs> you know, you said you were going to come and pay. He said, just calm down, Dr. Davis. will you know, now you're going to stay here and you're going to work for us. But it's not the same as when you're in charge mm -hmm. of the whole thing, you know, in your own three districts. And so it was after that, though, that um, I was offered, I got a call asking, would I want to go to Rajasthan and um, be at the state level and um, work in the desert? I said, well, let me think about this because desert again I mean I'm not a desert person but anyway you know we they'd already announced in India that we were down to zero now we're waiting for the certification team to come and you you're so close you want to be there for mm -hmm. for for the end you know and so yeah go go to Rajasthan and be at the state level but you know I was going to go to every district in Rajasthan. I was going to check. We were going to, I was going to work with a smallpox team. We were going to get ready. You didn't, not, none of the states knew where the team would go. It was up to them to choose. But I knew. 
that they would want to come to Rajasthan because they would be really curious. They would not be certain that variolation wasn't occurring in the desert region. And how are we going to prove that it's not? And I thought of all the states, I mean, they're going to want to see West Bengal too, but they're going to want to come to Rajasthan. I knew we would have the certification. So we need it to be ready. We needed to have all the forms, everything correct and all. And, and WHO Delhi wanted us to uh, do a special search, mm-hmm. a special um, search in the desert where we would look to see who had been vaccinated, who's the youngest child. So when was the last time there was who had um, pock marks mm-hmm. that there was actual smallpox to try and get it. When was it eradicated? I mean, at least in the desert, people are far apart. So it's hard for, because it has to be passed person to person, it's hard to keep that propagation going mm-hmm. when you have these nomads. So they said, your task, besides doing this special search, you need to find out. I mean, they knew for certain that in Pakistan, in the desert, and Afghanistan, in certain areas, they did variolation. Why wasn't it occurring in India? It just didn't seem right. Even though everyone said, never heard of this. What are you talking about? So that was my task to find that out. And West, and so, West Bengal is on the, well, if you're looking at uh, the east. On east, and then you're moving all the way over to the western to, part of to India. The west, to and the, it's a large, right, much larger region. I'm I'm uh, I'm right next to Pakistan. Pakistan, yeah. And then you have the Thar Desert. Mm-hmm. So and if you go far enough, I mean, there was the Border Patrol there. They they use camels, you know, right. uh, the Border Patrol. And um, but as soon as I got there, I talked to all the DHOs in the in, in the border area, and of course, they said, "I don't know what you're talking about, Doctor Davis." Okay. Before you go further, you got to explain what variolation is. Okay. Not a new thing. That's a new people thing for get, a lot of people. People get confused between variolation and vaccination. Mm-hmm. Okay. In variolation, the, the person tries to find someone who has a mild case of smallpox, and they will either take the pus or the scabs and they will make a solution. And then in scratches in the skin, they will put this solution on. And so it kind of looks like you're vaccinating, but what they're really doing is you are transferring smallpox from this person immediately to this other person. You're giving them smallpox so they can get smallpox and they don't necessarily get a mild case. They could get a blown up case. They can die from this. So they're transferring smallpox. Now in vaccination, you're taking the, the, the antigen and you're attenuating it in some way so that it causes an immunity, but it doesn't cause you to get the disease. You don't break out in pustules and you're not gonna die. It protects you, it gives you immunity. So you, you you don't want this practice going on where you're spreading smallpox, but everyone is saying they never even heard of it and they think you're crazy, you know? So I went up to the border patrol to ask, I needed camels, guides, and uh, maps that I needed in addition to setting off looking at the history of smallpox in these desert areas and seeing how, what percent of the population had been vaccinated. And and most of the people in the desert were Muslim. Um, And and it turned out to be variolation was done by the fakirs, their priest, when someone, because they're also um, know a lot about health and they would be called by nomad groups if their group, if one got it, it's just much better if everyone got the the disease at the same time, because uh, if every year you get pulled aside because somebody or a family is sick. 
So um, it was important to, to find, but when you started asking, do, do you have any fakirs who, who, who did this variolation? They wanted to know, why do you want to know? All of them went to Pakistan when uh, the partition occurred. Um, you know, I said, I know you, you think something bad is going to happen to them. I said, look, I just want to talk to them. You know, you know me. What, what am I going to do? I'm not going to put them in jail. I just want to know if they did this practice. Maybe they didn't even do it. So I got three names, two of which were dead. I figured out we're dead, but one was still alive and here on our side. And he was somewhere in this section of the desert. So we went out, I mean, for a week, I'd go from encampment to encampment and they'd say, oh, he was here a week ago. And, um, but where does he live? Where does he stay? Uh, someone over here. And so we would keep on going to finally, uh, I thought, this is like a needle in a haystack. I'm not going to be able to find this guy. When we came ac across this homestead and there, this old lady was there tending the fire, we came down on our camels and I said, I'm Dr. Davis and uh, I'm looking for her husband. I I'm looking for this man. And he said, yeah, that's that's my husband. This is our homestead. I said, okay, where is he? He said he was just called. Some kid had um, uh, some health problem, and he went off on the camel. And I thought, I I can't stand this. Um, we're always missing him. And so then I said, well, let's talk to her. Let's see if she, she even knows what I'm talking about. And so I said, there used to be this practice where you would do, you know doesn't mean any name to her, but where you would take some scabs and you would say, oh yeah, yeah. I helped my my husband prepare everything. I can tell you exactly, you know, what we did. You know, you'd get a call. We would both go out to the nomad community. He'd look, examine all the ones who had smallpox. He would take the person who had the mildest case. And then we would take the scabs and then we would take um, breast milk and we would boil that, chop it up, make this solution. And then I took like seven needles, needles like to sew and you would bind them together. But this is what you dipped in the solution. And then in the snuff box, this is where you vac, where you, you vaccinated the person in this area. You would do, you know, five, six times puncture, puncture the skin, and then you'd put the solution on, and then you'd take the leaf of the berry plant, and then you'd wrap it up. And then in five to seven days, they would have smallpox. Um, so I said, um, so is your husband still doing that? And she said, no. I said, but, but why not? She said, because the government has a program for it. I said, okay, but you know, he probably has a, a little jar where he keeps scabs because they'd already done studies like 12 years on scabs still had the virus, you know, I mean, so WHO already knew that. And what they were concerned about is if you've got this jar and then some kid 20 years later comes is playing in the desert. He opens this thing. It scatters. Someone comes, brings their animals. They get and you reintroduce smallpox. So I said, so so he's got this this little jar with some scabs. I, I need to know where she said, why would he keep scabs? Smallpox was everywhere. You, you didn't need to keep it. You could always find someone who had smallpox to, to make the solution. So he never kept scabs. We don't have that. So I wrote that all up and I thought, we're home free. And 
The thing is, at partition, a lot of the fakirs had gone to Pakistan because they were Muslim, had moved there. And so he he, he was the last of the people who, who did it, and he hadn't done it for, now I'd have to look up the paper. I mean, he hadn't done it for 10 years. Once the government program started, he wasn't called anymore. He didn't keep gabs. You don't have to worry about that. You want some tea? Yes, you know. And then I wrote that up and I said, we don't have to worry about that. They did do it, but they don't do it now. Then we had the report from um, the three uh, districts in, in, the, in the desert area about when was the, the last case there, looking at pock marks from people, you know, was a five-year-old. So it had been a long time since they'd had smallpox in the desert and stuff. So, and of course, the, the certification team wanted to come out and to see Rajasthan and, of course, to ride on a camel and, um, you know, mm -hmm. um, and one month before they're coming, I get a call about a rash and fever case in the desert in Bomber. And I thought, Delhi is calling me. Everyone is calling me to go out there. And I thought, well, it's got to be chicken pox. But, you know, the DHO was a young guy. He reported this. He was not going, you know, he thought it was chicken pox, but it was very early. He didn't know he, he was supposed to report it. He reported it. So here's the expert coming. You know, villagers all around want to know what my opinion is. And I said, before I go in, because we had like 400 people or so, I said, who was the person who reported the rash and fever case? Because I, I want to give them their reward. They did the right thing. You know, now it's for somebody who knows, is it chicken pox, is it smallpox, but let me give them their reward. Because I want them to know that this wasn't just a rumor that we paid people for, for reporting rash and fever. We got them. So I said, then take me to this case. Now it's dark. You have the kerosene lantern. You're looking at this 11-year-old, you know, rash on a dark skin is hard to see even in daylight. But I circled an area and I could see different stages, you know, with papular, macular, hadn't started crusting. Now, chicken pox is fast. In four hours, you're going to see some other crops. So I said, made the circle. I only see macular and pustular. No rash on the palms or soles of the feet. I'm pretty sure, I'm certain it's chicken pox. But I'm going back again four hours later. And now we have crusting new papillars. It's chicken pox. Okay, I told the DH, you go send a telegram now to Delhi that Dr. Davis says it's this. I said, I'm going back to the major city and get real good night's sleep, <laughs> you know? So, can, I mean, a month before the certifications team coming and we've got a rash and fever case in Rajasthan, that's all I need. I mean, God, really? Why me? No, no, really? <laughs> you know, I loved it. I loved it. Oh, Jesus Christ. So you made so, a lot of relationships. There was a lot of relationships that you made there. I mean, there. You, do you still have people there that you know? Have you gone back? So I worked twice in India, 20 years apart. Okay. And, and when I came back, I went to Rajasthan mm -hmm. because I wanted to see, I had a five-year-old daughter at the time um, that I had adopted. And we went to Rajasthan and I had been real good friends with um, a guide who, who took tourists around Jaipur. And he used to bring me the overland tour, the ones who were the guides. He'd bring them to my house because he knew there weren't any expats in Jaipur at that time. So he knew you needed to speak with some, some of your own kind. 
And so they'd come and bring beer and I would share my scotch and um, they'd tell me tales about going overland, coming to India. So um, I tracked him down Mm -hmm. because I knew he could help me track my my smallpox workers in in Jaipur to find out uh, where they were. But um, the driver was still working and he was off on a, an assignment, but the nurse had gone to his ancestral home out of Jaipur. And so, you know, I, I had a card and I said, give it to this guy. And if uh, Dinesh ever comes back, just to show him that, you know, Dr. Davis came back to see, um, to see how you're going and what you were doing, um, you know, and uh, to see um, this guide was particularly good person explaining the customs of Rajasthan and where he thought I needed to look. Um, what was his know, name? His name, um, Jesus. I'll have to look it up. That's fine. Yeah, no, but um, so I came back and my parents, um, when I was posted in Pakistan, um, I brought them because Pakistan was really hard traveling and um, caste system and everything. So I wanted to show them um, Jaipur and um, you know the Lahore and stuff. So when we came to Jaipur, I had contacted my guide for him to um, get a hotel room for them, and um, you know he, he took care of us and showed my parents and I around where I used to work and take us up to the palace. And um, yeah, it was it was fun to mm-hmm. reunite. Um, and I was hoping to get back. Um, you know, we were supposed to have a big meeting in 2020 and that was canceled. Mm-hmm. But some UK film thing had asked me, would I be interested in going back to Rajasthan mm-hmm. and seeing the, you know, finding the old people? And I said, yes, I, you know, I'm ready to do that if you're paying. <laughs> you know, and I've been contacted once I wrote um, Sita Lamata, one of the sons of uh, the DHO in the desert area. He said, you don't know me, but you know my father. He's died, but I want to write up what he's done. And I, I saw your book. And so he had written to ask me, what did I remember of his dad? And during that time when I had asked them to do the special search, you know, um, so at least he would still be alive and all, you know, the thing is, most of those people are dead. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I was young and now I'm not young. <laughs> so it happens. Yeah, right. To all of us, I guess. <laughs> So I wanted to return to one thing that I thought was really interesting is that communication, it's not like it is today where we have cell phones and everybody can talk to each other and we can talk to each other like we're doing right now and we're not in the same place. What was the communication like when you were even in West Bengal just to get, was it all by letter? Was it by word of mouth? How long did that communication take? You sent a telegram. Was that at 24 hours or did they get that telegram like in no, the telegram you get it within an hour or so? Okay. I mean, Calcutta knew <laughs> that okay. this woman was loose up there. And All right. What was going on. But I mean, the only way to communicate, there was no cell phone or computer. Mm-hmm. So, and that's why um, the DHOs would not know where I would be. So if I was in, when I would come into a new district, I would tell them, okay, this week I'm going to be along the border in this division, the next week after. So they would know if they had to try and get someone to find me about a a case, you know, you need to kind of know. And then I would always let 
send a note. There are always smallpox workers around. You could send mm-hmm. a letter to the chief. Kuch Bihar was the chief district over the three of them, Darjeeling, Jaipaguri, Kuch Bihar. So that he would know, even though he was difficult to work with, I had my own money. I can do what I want, but I wanted him to know where I was. Mm-hmm. So he, in case he had to find me, but you had to physically go and tell them or send someone with a chit, with a note. Um, I mean, there weren't telephone. Uh, there was telephone. Mm-hmm. But that would be like in a major hotel or the DHO's office, but it wasn't anything available. And there was the post office, but that was slow. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, so, but it always astonished me that people knew when the major festivals were. Like in Rajasthan, there's a smallpox temple and everyone knows when when that week when that festival occurs and these are people who are illiterate and, and i mean there's no there's radio but they don't have a radio and then in the five star hotel there may be a tv with two channels but who goes to the hotel mm-hmm. but it was amazing um about a month after we'd done the containment in those first villages um in uh Kuch Bihar, They had sent out where they wanted me to come because they were going to have a celebration that no one got sick and they wanted to see if I could come. And I'm up some lonely road, two divisions over, and I get stopped. And they said, you're Dr. Davis. I said, yeah, right. Um, The village where you did the containment, they want to know at the end of the month, Friday, can you be there? for a celebration to celebrate that nobody got sick. So I said, you tell them I'll be there. I, I will come. And I thought, how, how do they get that? You mm-hmm. know, but that, that would be, that's how it's word of mouth. It's sending runner. It's, you know, and then there's the telegram mm-hmm. that um, you send that and then everybody knows. And Wow, that's community sends. knowledge. Yeah, no, no, it's yeah. and then everyone, I mean, they know your vehicle and then you're the only lady. I mean, there's no, there was no woman epidemiologist, Indian, mm-hmm. that it, for, it would have been really difficult for a wo- Indian woman doctor to break all those taboos. Whereas I didn't believe it. I didn't believe that I was born this caste and, um, and and this is how I have to live my life. And so um I'll I'll take that bad karma on. Mm-hmm. I think I can I I can get away with it. But um, you know, in the end though, they they treated me as if I was a white male doctor. <laughs> Although they never believed I was American. I was Indian. If we were in West Bengal, you're not from here, Dr. Davis. You're from Delhi. If I'm in Delhi, you're Indian, Dr. Davis, but you're not from Delhi. You're from Kerala. When I went to Kerala after all the work was over, they said, you're Indian, but but you're not from Kerala. You're from West Bengal. So I was always, you know, I said, why don't you think I'm, I'm American? I said, you've seen the male American doctors. They do have wives, you know, they, no, you're Indian. You know, I don't know why you keep on denying it, but you do speak funny, you know, because they're expecting you to speak with a British accent, that you're English, but you know, and that American accent take throws them a while or a loop. But but you're not American. Uh, I just gave up, you know, fine. Did you feel like you belonged there? Or did you just feel by yourself? Did you ever feel alone or lonely? No, you you got lonely, but probably my overwhelming feeling, especially in the first six months where I didn't know where I would sleep each night, was exhaustion. Mm. I was tired 
from 12 hour days. And I can see where someone who's 28, you can do this for so long, but if you were 50, you can't, you can't, you can't, that's why they need it. Junior doctors. You just mm-hmm. can't keep up with that kind of, of, of rhythm and, and what was needed. Mm-hmm. And, um, but it was really curious in all those two years, there were only two times that I couldn't, we were far away from any doc bungalow. And I, uh, we had to go to the village and ask the village headman if he would put me up. Because three of us can't sleep in the car. I mean, the two of them can sleep in the front and the back seat. But now what to do with. So um, and and the chief would put me in um, his wife's, you know, compartment. (laughs) But that's an uneasy sleep, too, because they haven't seen an American, but we know she's really Indian. But she's, you know, so and you have all these you know, you're washing, well, everyone washes, but in the tap, you know, Mm -hmm. but uh, you get into these pajamas, but they sleep in their, the clothes that they had on. So, you know, you're being looked at, you know, what is this bra? You know, it's just, you're You're always, you're on display. Right. Like a zoo animal. It's, it's an uneasy sleep. I'm thankful that they let me stay. Um, but it's interesting that I did get to be in the dock bungalows most of the time and um, uh, was always, there was a room that was available and the guard was also a cook. You got in early enough, you gave him money, he could go out and make you a chicken curry and stuff, you know. Um, so these dock bungalows sound like secure Airbnbs. They're... <laughs> Um, they're not Airbnbs. They were normally one or two bedroom, something a little better than a shack. I mean, you know, it, it would have, there would be water attached and there would be a kitchen. There would be a guard station. Usually they didn't have a a fence or anything around them. Mm -hmm. There would be the stables for the horses and then now for the cars. Um, what did you sleep on? A charpoy. So it's um, it, it's a wooden frame, single, but it's thick rope that goes back and forth that mm-hmm. you're that you lie on. The charpoy. It's a rope bed. Mm. That was the usual. They didn't have mattresses, okay. and I bought a um a little Chinese red kerosene lantern that I would read at night before going to sleep. I was a voracious reader. And of course, uh, there are no libraries or books. So before I left Delhi, there were these secondhand stores. So I went to Connaught Circus and I bought like 15 books, hardback, because you didn't have paperback. And the only thing that's available are the exploits of the British explorers, you know, young Hudsman going to Ladakh or someone trying to sneak into Tibet. And so I know British history and the Anglo-Indian War and all that because I was reading these exploits, but I knew where I wanted to visit. I wanted to go and see Tibet. Mm-hmm. I wanted to, you know, uh, to go to Afghanistan, but I'd read all these journals. And um, so that's how I read myself off to sleep. And then you got up at five, six in the morning and you were off again, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, mm-hmm. so, after the caste you, system was yeah. the hardest thing. Yeah. And there were a few instances where I wasn't paying attention. And I asked this Brahmin uh, if he could give me a glass of water. And as soon as I said it, because uh, I'd left my thermos in the car and we'd been going through the village asking questions. 
making sure the vaccinator had been by. And uh, he, um, he looked at me, then he closed the door. And then I turned to um, my nurse and I said, oh, Jesus, I shouldn't have asked him. Um, you know, then he came back out and he had a glass, one of his glass, and th they have their pots and inside it's cool. Because, so it's, the water stays pretty cool. And he carefully handed me the glass. So we didn't touch hands or anything, but I drank this water because I was so parched. And I said, oh, you saved me. I said, thank you so much. He took the glass, then he smashed it on the ground to show me that I had, there was no way of washing that could ever purify this glass. So he broke that. And then I knew that he, he had the sacred thread that he had to go to the temple and would have to go through this purification thing because he had handed me this glass of water. You know, and I turned to uh, um, Ramesh and I said, why didn't he just say, I, I can't give it to you? You know, and I have sent you back to the car to go and get the, the, the thermos. I mean, we didn't really have to go through this big thing, you know. Um, fine, you don't want to give it to me. Great. But, you know, outcasts couldn't even use the well. They had to go to the creek where the water is well, give you instant diarrhea. Mm -hmm. That was one thing. Um, I was pretty careful about mm -hmm. drinking and getting uh, wherever I was staying to boil the water for 20 minutes so that in the morning I could put it into my, my canteen. Yeah. Um, and where did I get sick? It's in Calcutta at a four-star hotel that has all the thermoses said, this water's been boiled. And then I come in one afternoon early and I see the guy, houseboy, is leaning over the bathroom tub and is filling up the thermos from the tub water faucet. And I thought, Oops. oh my God, because I've been really drinking a lot of water. The thing is, because there was no place to pee, I would really go dry during the day. I mean, I could drink eight cups of tea and not pee, but because there wasn't any place for a woman to pee, um, I'd have to wait till I got to the dock bungalow and then start drinking a lot of, I mean, I had my thermos, but I needed to, to ration. Mm -hmm. So I'd have just enough to keep me going, then drink two, three liters at night you know, and all the old hands say, you're going to ruin your kidney, Connie, that way you have to keep. And I say, you guys are men. You just stand to the side of the road and you pee. That, that That's not easy for me. I, I can't do that, mm -hmm. you know. And even now, I mean, you go, when I did uh, consultancies um, in 2014, 15, 16, it's still, um, you, you, you can't, there's just so few places for women you know, to, to pee. And um, so, and sexism, I mean, you couldn't, it, it was hard for the male smallpox workers to actually talk with the women in the house. Now it's the women in the house are going to be taking care of anybody who's sick. You really want them to see, you want everyone to see the, the smallpox photo but you need them to recognize so that they tell their husband, I think the kid has smallpox, go and tell someone about this. But because of caste, because of the women being in perda seclusion, you can't get to them. So, you know, I would, when I went checking up on the smallpox workers, I'd say, take me to your chief first of the village. And I'd say, look, this is high priority. Smallpox is high priority in India. So when any of my smallpox workers come, you are to find a 10-year-old male child from this village. He is to accompany my smallpox worker and he's to go with him house to house. 
because he can go into the house. He's 10 years old. He's, mm -hmm. he, he's, and he can go in the house and he can make sure that each of the women have seen this, that no one has seen a rash and a fever case like that. Come back and tell him and do that. I said, don't, don't have him just, nobody's coming to the door or he's only talking to the men. The men are sitting, sitting under a tree. He, he, you know, they're not the ones taking care of whoever is sick. Right. So, but you, and you can do that. And I'm going to come back and see, you know, and don't tell me you searched. And then I go, I had an uncanny ability of putting my hand on a village and the DHO, oh, that village is well covered. No, you don't want to go that, you know, it's a long way away, Dr. Davis. Anytime they start doing an excuse, I said, and I want you to go with me. You know, there's a river that we're going to have to, I said, we'll swim the river. Now I'm not a big swimmer, but we're going to this village. Don't, I, I think it'd be better for you. I said, I picked the village I want and I want you to go with me. And then you find out there hasn't been a smallpox worker there for a year, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and they definitely, because of emergency and all, didn't want to be reported. I mean, as a WHO consultant, you had extraordinary power. In fact, they could not refuse getting vaccinated. You know, I never had any problem convincing people to get vaccinated, mm -hmm. but a, lot, a number of the smallpox um, uh, doctors did. And, you know, you could call the soldiers or the police and make them get vaccinated because if you had cases, you, you need everyone vaccinated. You're mm -hmm. doing containment. You, you got every, every single person has to get vaccinated. So I could always, you don't have to kick the door down. That was one thing because you're a woman, they can see I can't force you to do anything. I can only joke with you or, you know, get you to, are you afraid of a little, <laughs> a little vaccination? Are you going to cry? Did I cry? Ladies? No. Mm -hmm. So, but um, yeah, some people had problems and then you had to bring force, but mm -hmm. um, I never did. Are there any um, special things that while you were there that have really stayed with you throughout your career? Um, do you know, I, you know, your clothes are beat on the banks of a river on the rocks in order to get them clean. Mm -hmm. And so my, um, one of my Curtis was really getting frayed. So when I was passing by, the mission, I asked Father LaFerla, had he gotten any secondhand clothes in? And he said, there's just a, a delivery from Calcutta today. You know, kind of go on in, you can take anything you want, you know. So I went in and I saw the stack of um, blouses and shirts, stack of pants. And so I saw this black, the sleeve, and it looked like a sleeve of a shirt I used to have it was these fine green and I thought well but you know it can't but anyway I flipped it back and I pulled it out and I said well I'll know if it's mine because for camp my mother would sew my iron your name you know that name tag is not coming out I looked in the collar and it said Cornelia Davis now what it's the likelihood. I know what my mother did. I'm not coming back home. So she's getting rid of these camp clothes. So she sends them to St. Vincent de Paul. Now, St. Vincent de Paul could send it to Africa or, or to Asia Clinic. And even if they sent it to Calcutta, why would that shipment make it up to this one little mission in West Bengal and Kush Bihar? And I also find my, found my jeans there too. And I ran, Father LaFerla, you will not believe this. That blew me away. I mean, that I got my own clothes back in India. I, I couldn't believe it. I also we went in to see Mother Teresa when we were called down to um, for meetings. Um, I in went Calcutta. after uh, Durga um, Festival. It was right close to the Kali Temple. 
And so I and another um, uh, epidemiologist, I said, let's go by and, you know, we can give her some money. And, you know, I mean, she was famous. Let's see the house for the dying and stuff. And, and she came down and she said, I I'm busy, but I wanted to, to say thank you for coming by. And my sister here is going to take you around and show you the different things. And thank you for your donation, you know. And uh, so, so that was really um, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, Very sweet. And, and oh. so after India, what did you do next? I took the long road home. Anyway. Yeah, I can imagine. And, well, I thought, when will I ever be back here? And WHO was giving me a round the world ticket on Pan Am. Mm -hmm. So I said, all right. Um, these overland guys that I met in Jaipur, they'd said, if you get to Afghanistan, to Kabul, you know, you need to go and stay in Mustafa Hotel near Chicken Street, a dollar a night. So I had that one name. So I thought I wanted to go to Afghanistan because I'd gotten very interested in Buddhism when I was in India. So I, uh, for the two weeks, three weeks, I was in India seeing the places I wasn't posted to. I'd gone to Goa, was also an area where Buddhism was. Madhra Pradesh. I went up to Banaras to see the burning ghats, but also um, uh, Sanchi, and then went up to Kashmir. Um, so then I wanted to see the tallest standing Buddha, which is in Bamiyan in Afghanistan. I, I, I thought, I, I just want to see that. And then from Afghanistan, I, I had the, the ticket Pan Am. So I'll go to Tehran and see the peacock throne on Tehran. And the Shah was still there. And then um, I had a real close friend who was in medical school with me. When I went to India, she went to work um, to teach in the medical school in Nairobi, Kenya. And she said, Connie, when you finish up, come on to Nairobi and you can stay in our house, but you got to get here before a certain date because um, we're going to be going on home leave too. And she had had a little baby overseas uh, who was like nine months. So I was trying, I, I needed to coordinate all this so I could get to Nairobi before they left, you know. So um, actually, um, when I'm leaving um, on the plane to go uh, on Indian Airlines and they're saying, you're 10 pounds overweight. So you need to go and pay, you know, and it was like, I don't know. I said, great. You know, I've been working the last two years in the rural area, eradicating smallpox. And if, if you can't see it in your heart, just to give me this 10 pounds on my defo bag, it's fine. Tell me where I'm supposed to go and pay. She said, oh, no, no. If you were did smallpox, no, no, you you can get on. But I thought, I'm not going to get away with this all the time. I've got to somehow get rid of baggage or luggage because I, I can't give this tired uh, refrain all the way. But anyway, I got in the plane. There was only one woman, and that was me. And I thought, uh, I knew it was going to be really different because they were fundamental. And I was wearing my Indian clothes that I would normally wear in India. So I knew I was correct in all things. Um, but I thought, uh, and because these guys going overland told me, you know, you're solo female. You just don't see too many of them, Connie. You, you may have a hard time. So I don't know you're going to stay that long in Kabul. But anyway, I got up there and, um, you know, the only hotels that you can book in advance are those that are going to be at least three stars. So that hotel that I had booked was like $25 a night, which my budget wasn't going to make it on 25 a night. There was the you know, the Hilton or something on the hill, $100. So I thought I've got to 
get over, find the tourist office, see if they're doing a tour up to Bamiyan, get on that, then go by and um, uh, try and find Mustafa Hotel because I should move over there a dollar a night. <laughs> this this will save me, you know? And so uh, that's what I did and um, went over, um, went up to see Bamiyan. And then two years later, Russians come in. And after that, the Taliban. And uh, I liked Afghanistan. And while in 75, women were still going to the university and they didn't wear, the young women didn't wear the burqa. They just had put a scarf over their head. But you could feel that it was changing, that things were tightening up, that um, um, you saw more and more men out shopping, not women, you know. Um, and then once the Taliban took over, everything is like it is now. I really felt I had an opportunity to go back when I was with um, USAID to join a WHO TB survey evaluation. But then um, WHO deemed it was too dangerous mm. to send people. So um, I never got back to Afghanistan. Then from Afghanistan, I went to Tehran. And then things, I mean, Pan Am 75, it started reducing all of their far flung weird legs, you know, like how many people really a week go from Kabul to Tehran to Europe, you know, so I don't, they were, they were getting ready to, they were really downsizing. So I get to Tehran and they say there is no Pan Am. They'd already canceled that leg. There was no more. <sighs> I thought, oh, now how am I going to get to uh, my next stop is getting to Nairobi. And I just spent days running around trying to find out what plane still came in. But if you go out there at night, you know, and there's no room, then how are you getting back? And so finally someone said, go to El Al. Well, I'm going to pick an Israeli airline to take in. <laughs> you know, and just getting to them, man, you had to show your passport outside. It was like a fortress. Come inside and show your passport. Anyway, they did, they did have a plane. It was leaving the next day. It, it was going layover in Haifa and on to Nairobi. I said, sign me up, you know, to, to get out. But um, that wow. was one thing. The Pan Am ticket had so much value. That other little airlines were fine taking that and charging money for it, you know, mm -hmm. to, to get out. But um, wow. it was wow. uh, great. So then there and then on to Nairobi, I um, I was supposed to climb Kilimanjaro, but um, <laughs> of course you were my friends. Well, no, I while I, I had yeah. one vacation in India and I climbed to the base camp of Mount Everest. So. Kilimanjaro was on my, you know, since my friends were there, I asked, ask around and see if there's a, a group that will take on a solo person. And there was some South African group said I could join them. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, the East African Union of Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda was breaking up. So that meant if I drove my friend's Land Rover across the border, it could not come back. And they said, we love you, Connie, but um, we want our Land Rover. So my brother's here. Can't you just climb Kilimanjaro with him? Not Kilimanjaro, Mount Kenya. It's the tallest mountain in Kenya. So I did that instead. Oh, okay. And, and then um, from there, I went to Europe to see some people that I'd met in Jaipur, the au pair who was with a European family. They were on a, she was on a German farm. And um, so anyway, and then um, London and then back to, Ooh. you know, I thought I had to, actually DA Henderson came out to India to talk to all the junior staff mm -hmm. to find out what we were interested in, what we wanted to do. And he said, Connie, 
you've really done well. And we're starting, WHO starting this new EPI program, and I can get you in on this. And I said, you know, DA, thank you for offering that. It's just, I think I want international public health, but I, but I think I need to go back because I've never really worked as a pediatrician. I need to work at that and see if, you know, I want to. And so if I want peds or if I really want international. So I said, I have to turn this down. I just think, what if I hadn't? <laughs> well, how would life have been different if I'd gone immediately, you know, into WHO? But anyway, I went back and I um, got a job at Kaiser in Oakland. Um, I did a, a third year residency because I thought, well, you're going to have to take the boards and you might as well bone up on this. And um, two months in, I get this call and uh, in the emergency room and he s says, Connie. And I said, DA, how did you find me? He said, are you bored yet? <laughs> I broke out laughing. I said, uh, yeah. <laughs> he said, look, he's Dean of Hopkins now. He said, I have a scholarship for you. I want you to come back and get a master's in public health. Um, and it also covers your lodging and food, you know, besides tuition. I mean, how can you turn that down? So I said, I'm on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I went to Hopkins. And uh, if you're a doctor, the MPH is only one year. If you're anything else, it's two years. So then three months before the ending of that, uh, he called me down to his office and he said, okay, so what's after this? So I said, well, um, you know, I, I want to go back overseas. He said, that's what you told me. So you need to apply to EIS. It's um, CDC in Atlanta. I said, I have not lost anything in the South. I am not going to the South. Read my lips, DA. He said, you're the one who said you wanted to go back overseas and maybe work for WHO or UNICEF. He said, you have to work in the top public health institute. That's CDC. So he won. I went to Atlanta, you know, and then the rest is history. <laughs> No, I lost, but it was interesting. DA, he, he was a real mentor for, for those of us who are in the smallpox program, the junior, mm -hmm. you know, he, he, in the, you know, after two years, he'd find me and say, now, where are you now? Uh-huh. How was Pakistan? Okay. Now, now, where are you going? I mean, he kept tabs, mm -hmm. you know, on, um, uh, what you were doing, uh huh, going to get into HIV AIDS now, huh? Okay. You, you know, he was really, he was really good. He really looked after you. And at when you did your MPH on the weekends, if there was a smallpox worker coming in, he'd have a party and he'd invite all of us smallpox people at mm -hmm. Hopkins to come over to me. He was, uh, he was really a good guy. Yeah. Yeah. There are lots of stories about him. Mm -hmm. So you did, you went, you became an EIS officer. You get deployed mm -hmm. several different places. And then after that, you become a foreign service officer. Service officer. Yeah. yeah. You're at USAID at, in Pakistan. And then, and then back to CDC again. Yeah. Well, CDC got a big grant to do childhood communicable disease. Mm -hmm. And the triple CD project. And so they were looking for epidemiologists, uh, French speaking. Now, I wasn't quite French speaking. <laughs> so I told CDC, look, I've always been interested in French. And, you know, when I was in high school, I take some summer courses. So I'm pretty certain that I can go overseas. I'm going to go overseas for two months and then I'm going to come back and take the, the foreign service exam for French. And then you can send me, you know, to Abisha. <laughs> so they said, all right, they bet on me. 
So I went to the Francophone part of Belgium for two months and came back. And of course, I had to get the head of the institute to test me. And the first thing she asked me was, where did I learn my French? And I knew I was dead because I did not go. First of all, I didn't take it from them in D.C. And uh, I didn't go to France. <laughs> I went to Belgium. That's because the French were so mean to Americans. I didn't want to put up with it. The Belch weren't like that. And I went to the Francophone part. I mean, Saran was excellent. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just that if you'd gone through their training, you would have known there are five parts to the exam and you must speak subjunctive. If you don't speak subjunctive, they're not going to give you a 3-3. How was I supposed to know? I took subjunctive. I knew that. I mean, I knew it. Mm -hmm. So I had to do one more month, you know, the Beltway bandits, these language, but they knew what was what you needed to pass. And they found someone. They said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Abidjan. They found someone from Cote d'Ivoire who for, to work with me and to, to go through each of the parts of the exam, but particularly the oral and that I speak, you know, uh, subjunctive. And uh, the next time I got her again and I thought, God, you're not being helpful here. But she passed me three, three and on to Abishan, where, you know, I had um, I was based in Abishan, but I also uh, was to provide technical expertise to Liberia, to Mali and to Togo. Mm -hmm. So um, there was. A little bit of traveling there, um, the the French, um, and you know, having the opportunity to open up model or oral rehydration therapy center, and then I had done the original work to prove that mothers could do this. I, it was just some of the stuff that's happened to me is just weird that way, you know. Um, yeah, it comes uh, full circle. Circle, yeah, yeah. No, no. So we've come to almost the end Full of our time. Yeah. yeah, right. But I wanted to do some reflections on your um, on your smallpox work because it seems like that and the early days were sort of set you up for, prepares you for other things. Mm -hmm. um, what, what kind of impact do you think that um, the whole India program had on the global eradication program? Well, everybody, you, you know, knew uh, or thought they knew India would never eradicate smallpox. Mm -hmm. There was no way. They just had so many millions of villages, the illiteracy, the caste system. It wasn't. If India could do it, well, then the world could get there was the possibility that the world could be eradicated. So, you know, I mean, Bangladesh, Pakistan, they're all way smaller. I mean, they just knew. But the thing is, Indira, Indira, she had taken this on. She was going to show you Westerners that India could do this. So, so smallpox was high priority. Mm -hmm. Whatever smallpox, WHO wanted for smallpox, you got it, you know? Mm -hmm. That was the only program. When you went into a DHO's office and you said, I want you to drop everything and you travel with me, they had to. That mm -hmm. was their directive. They could not, they were to give you all aid that you wanted. Now you had money, you could buy your petrol. You didn't have to help ask for help on that, but- and I'm sure that caused a lot of resentment in the other programs because, I mean, maybe you're in, repro well, the reproductive health one, uh, because there was the population control. People really didn't like that. Villagers would just flee if they thought it was a family planning vehicle that came. I remember early on, we came to a village. 
And we went, it was like the plague had been there, except there's no bodies on the ground. The fires are still burning, the pot's on. It's like, but where did they go? Why? And then some 10-year-old boy comes out. He sees and he tells him, no, 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 it's smallpox. So then everyone comes back in. But if it had been family planning, because, you know, they were, you had so many men that needed to get uh, sterilized each month. And the villager headman had his quota. So it was really, I mean, it coerced people. There wasn't, it was not, I signed up because I wanted it. But you knew who did it because they got a transistor radio afterwards for doing that. For wow. getting sterilized, but uh, there was a lot of resentment against. Mm -hmm. um, and then malaria had been working for years and had never anywhere achieved close. So, you know, it was like when it was eradicated and we had the big celebration and, you know, other um, WHO people in, would say, so, Connie, so, so you eradicated smallpox. The kid's just going to die of measles or diarrhea. So, you know, and I thought, okay, you just, you're just jealous that, you know, we were successful, but it also became clear that, you know, when you put so much emphasis on one program, but there are these others, primary health care, you really did need to address diarrheal disease, you know, the childhood illnesses that are killing kids. Mm -hmm. um, malaria has always been there, still is. We've got a vaccine now that looks like it's doing something. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, I said, well, I did one thing now, you know, um, I can't help all the rest, but, but, you needed to go on to to get away from the vertical program to the the horizontal primary health care you you know if you raise one boat you raise them all uh, you, you needed a different strategy but it was such a feeling when you knew you were close and all your workers knew that and they really pulled for that it was an accomplishment. Still is. I've worked yes. on polio, you know, eradication and um, how coming close. And then you have another, when I was in DR Congo um, as health officer, you know, an outbreak. And I'm thinking, geez, it, you, you know, it's just, we thought smallpox was hard, but yeah, but everything else is, is, is just as hard, but um do you, do you think it's, do you think public health and politics have to go hand in hand? I think the U.S. has really, it's, it, it's not the U.S. I mean, when I was growing up, I thought the 50s weren't real great for African-Americans, but I haven't seen, and I thought when Obama got in all this time, I'm overseas, but that America had moved. Not you don't move on. I mean, there's systemic racism and stuff, but that we've gotten better. That, but when Trump got in, he let all the racist out of their little holes, and that they could say what they want and get away with it, and put in draconian laws. And so, um, you know, the CDC that I worked at was whatever cdc said i mean nobody nobody made any attempt to say something different i mean it's 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 just incredible that you have people who know nothing that say you don't have to wear a mask okay cdc made some mistakes with coronavirus um we're not all perfect it's a new disease you have to see what it does but um, this, the polarization, the, um, the anti-vaxxers, I mean, most of these people wouldn't be around if their parents hadn't gotten them vaccinated to begin with. And it all starts with a lie on autism. You prove that, but it's somehow the lie stays. Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, it's just, 
it's just incredible. It's I, I, I find it would be very hard working now at CDC. I found it, I mean, when for dengue, they um, one of my things they sent me, I was to go to Texas because um, uh, Mexico is having a big outbreak. And I was to go to the AMA and the county, you know, and to give lectures. And then I was to do two serological surveys along the border, looking to see if we had um, infection on our side. You know, and I told my <laughs> supervisor, I said, um, do you really think you should send me to Texas? I mean, he said, um, Connie, do, do you work in virology? Yeah. He said, um, is, is this an outbreak? Yeah. He said, well, I said, all right, I'm going. But I mean, I didn't want to go to Houston and see all these people. <laughs> and then Austin. Austin was nice. There were mm -hmm. some young doctors there. And one came up after the lecture and said, first time Austin, I said, yeah. He said, do you want to go and hear some music? And I said, yeah. I said, is it okay? <laughs> anyway, he took me uh, to hear some music. And then I got on the plane to go down to Metamorris and to start uh, the, the work. And I went out with a public health nurse who knew the community. So you really got to get to the community. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're talking about some of my reflections, you have to get to the lowest level and you have to see what they think and how they think and what are their concerns. But in going with her, no one put up any objection for me collecting information and bloods from them so I could ship them back to CDC, you know, so we could see if dengue has been there, but we just haven't picked it up before or, mm -hmm. uh, what but it's because i was with someone from the community they'd known her she'd worked for 15 years they knew you know she was um she was looking after their best interests so um, mm -hmm. um so there was a trust issue i mean they trust. trusted her yeah, yeah. so there has Always. to be a trust yeah just like when you were in um the boy who came out and realized that yeah, you weren't there for family planning Yes. He trusted yeah. the smallpox people to do the right thing. Yeah. No. And, you know, the things I learned in smallpox field work helped me through all my field work ever after. Mm -hmm. You have to get out of the capital and you have to go down to the lowest level. And it doesn't matter what even your NGOs tell you. This is what they found. You have to verify it. So you need to go down to the community and see, did they really do that work? Was that correct? And probably, you know, when I worked at USAID, it's probably one of the few USAID health directors who went to the field all the time because new workers, I would train them. You come with me. I want to see how you talk to people, how you handle this is what I do, you know, so then I know how they are and if they can get the information um, that we need. But you, you got to go to the community. And then because I'd worked for WHO and UNICEF um, in uh, Senegal, whenever any new post, after meeting the national government health, uh, Ministry of Health, I would go to WHO and UNICEF because I knew they would have asked, who's the new person coming on? Where have they worked? And, you know, and they would say, you know, Connie, this new one, she's worked in UNICEF. So they know, you know who they are and what they're, what, what UNICEF is. You know, I always wanted to work for UNICEF because I couldn't understand how they got to go down and work with community NGOs. And yet WHO, couldn't. I mean, we had nothing set up, no, no, no platform set up for us to do. Why? Why? Because in their charter, it's written that they can go. Whereas we, we have to go to the Ministry of Health. And so that's why it made it 
really hard when I was the United Nations program on HIV AIDS, which was run by WHO. And so the six agencies were supposed to be putting HIV AIDS in their mainstream programs. But we also, WHO was tasked with giving grants to these little community NGOs and stuff. And I thought, um, you know, they had to make new, just for this program, they had to make new, new procedures. And so, I mean, even to get a desk uh, uh, and a chair for me, you didn't have anything set up because if you were in the Ministry of Health, that would be given to you. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like, you guys, this is crazy. You, you know, it was like reinventing the wheel where was UNICEF immediately down to the lowest level. Anyway, we we came through that. But um, just to show you the difference, though, 20 years later, I went back to India. Now, I knew I should never repeat a country. It's not good because it's never the same. And no. HIV AIDS was not high priority. It was stigmatized. It was so difficult working. And I thought, but people know me from before. It's going to be yeah. man, sex. HIV, telling people they need to use a condom. Um, it wasn't. It wasn't. That was that was really hard work. Mm -hmm. uh, HIV AIDS, and um, but we, UN AIDS funded an NGO that was doing um, working with injecting drug users and using needle exchange. Something that still isn't done a lot in the states i mean this was in what year was that i went back uh, um 20 years after 75 so in the 80s or something mid 80s yeah um and, and so the director came in and told me connie the eighth tibetan has walked in my clinic you have got to get in touch with the Dalai Lama and tell him that somebody is selling heroin up in a town that's below Dharamsala. And if he knows that, he can tell the com Tibetan community to stay away from this and all. I said, yeah, uh-huh, uh, Sam, I'm just supposed to pick up the phone and say, Dalai Lama, uh, this is uh, Dr. Connie Davis with UNA. He said, you know what, Davis, I have told you. I've done my duty. Now, how you get in contact, what you want to do, that's your problem. I thought, okay, what, what am I, how am I going to, I mean, I, I don't even have a telephone number, but I know that he has his ministry of health up in his area. So I know their address. So I have a letterhead, Indians like letterheads. And so I have the secretary type that, um, you know, I'm in charge this HIV program. It's a new disease. It's deadly. And um, one of my NGOs has seen, you know, eight Tibetans with doing injecting drug use. And this is a serious problem. I'm willing to come up and talk to the Dalai Lama about this new disease. And I sent it off this letter and thinking, well, first of all, it's going to take a week to two weeks for the Dalai Lama for the minister of health, his minister of health to get it. So let's just see what happens. And um, it turns out the Dalai Lama had a dream. He had a dream that there was a new disease that was affecting Tibetans. And so he called his minister of health in and he said, is there some new disease that's killing Tibetans? And the Minister of Health said, uh, Dalai Lama, there are many things that are killing Tibetans, but there's no new disease. They're dying of malaria, uh, uh, you know, TB. Um, uh, he said, no, I had a dream. It was a very disturbing dream. So I want you to call all the, the communities in Nepal. And you ask him if there's some new disease that's killing Tibetans. You call the communities that are in the South. They'd given some big tracts of land to Tibetans in the forest, hot. I mean, I don't know why anyone would go down there, but they needed more land. You call them, he said, 
there's some new disease. And then the next day, um, the minister of health gets my letter. He comes running to the Dalai Lama and he says, there's this Dr. Davis. And she says, there's this new disease called HIV AIDS and it's killing Tibetans. She said, she can come up and tell us about it. He said, I'm coming down to Delhi in two weeks. So you give her a private appointment, you know, and we'll get together. And so um, when I got the letter back from them, I called Luke. I said, you're coming with me in case they want to know about these Tibetans. And so when we walked into the meeting, uh, I walked through the door. The first thing the Dalai Lama said to me was, I had a dream about you. And I thought, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, like, wow, about me, <laughs> you know. And then so I told him, OK, my problem is I don't have any more money. And number two, the money we get for UNAIDS, it's for the Indian program. Now, I can't really take their money. I mean, I'd have to go through. I mean, they were fine with letting the Tibetans come in and all, but it's another thing when you start talking about if I could have some of your money. I said, look, if you can call your trainers, your health educators to come to Dharamsala and I can come up and do a training with Luke's and we can train your first staff. I can bring up all of our UNAIDS materials because we did the modules for HIV AIDS. And then I can leave some people to help you. They can help you trans. I mean, we have it in Hindi too. We have it in English, Hindi, but to sit with you while you're trans uh, translating it into Tibetan to do this. But I don't have any money that I can give to you right now this year to bring the staff together. I, I, I just, I'm all out of money. I've given it all away, but you just, you, you tell me when you're ready, I'll drop everything and do that. That was halfway through my uh, three years. And so he didn't get back to me until my last week in India. And I had planned to go relaxing somewhere with my daughter and, um, and I said, no, I promised. So um, I actually had a Tibetan nanny who took care of her men um, the last two years in Delhi. So I said, you go into this resort <laughs> in, in, in Delhi and take her men so she can play and all. I'm going up to do this week training. And uh, I, I'm so glad because to me, it's like I did my bit to save the Tibetans. Because once he knew about it, he could you know, alert the community, number one, that, you know, injecting drugs is bad, that the people, I mean, they moved those people who were there below out once he, he, he uh, got wind of what was going on. So that, um, you know, people started hearing about HIV AIDS and he brought people from Nepal and from the Southern communities and, um, so I had another um, private at the end of the training um, for him to, and they gave me two little Tibetan <laughs> carpets and thanking me for coming up and doing the training and all. So um, yeah, I it, it was it was really heartwarming mm -hmm. to. Uh, uh, and when I was in Delhi, I was trying to get to Bhutan, but it takes so long to, you know, that I was out, never got back to Bhutan, except as a tourist, mm. <laughs> um, yeah. you know, years later. But um, it was, um, what I found is that um, the basics that I learned in smallpox field work stayed with me and were the guiding forces through all of my work overseas mm -hmm. that the in having worked as a foreign service officer you know state department people trust you know they heard that they, they trust you in another way than if you're just a contractor mm -hmm. you know because I was WHO and UNICEF 
they always supported me in every country, you know, um, for what I thought we should be doing. And I supported them. Mm -hmm. And, um, and even, you know, when I moved to Mexico, I'm not looking to work here, I'm looking to retire and relax and um, go into community theater and um, do um, and write my memoirs. Um, but then when this coronavirus thing started, and early on in 2020, when the White House would not let CDC send out their initial recommendations on the prevention, they squashed that, the manuals and stuff. You know, I'm on the smallpox listserv. So someone at CDC had gotten that manual to us and they said, look at this and you can see if you can use it or whatever. So I looked at it and I thought, why let the Mexican or my state start from scratch on this? I mean, this would be useful. So I went to my lawyer and notario who um who knew, he has connections up at the state. I said, this is not something that I want to give to the municipality here. It's something because um, somebody at the state is now trying to figure out what they should be doing about this new disease. I'm not saying that this is a panacea for them, but they can use this as a guideline. See if any of it makes sense for Mexico. See what you need to twerk. And I said, I give you permission. Okay, they're going to say, Who, where did this come from? Is this legit? I said, you can tell them I worked for CDC. I worked for WHO. You can give them my name. I'm not trying to get on a board. I don't want, you know, you need to be better in Spanish. Because if you're convincing people, you can't have translation. You got to hear it and say, no, that's wrong. That's not what I said. So uh, I said, but you can tell them I, I don't, all I want is to, so they don't start from scratch. All right. You can start from what our top brains thought. And now you modify and apply. And, and the state came out with some good, you know, recommendations and stuff. And I said, and don't mention my name. If you, you can tell them what it is, but ask them, don't say Dr. Davis from CDC because I'm not now from CDC. Just, you know, <laughs> I don't want to get in a, <laughs> a big argument about stuff, but if they can use it, I'm happy. I'm glad, you know, because that's my bid to help Mexico where you're being hospitable to me. So mm -hmm. anyway, it's a good story. Anyway, yeah. So I got to ask you about the necklace around your neck though. What is this oh, amulet? The beautiful this amulet. amulet. Um, when I was in Rajasthan, I used to wear this. I had lots of uh, smallpox amulets, but in most of India, uh, Sita Lamata, the smallpox goddess, is represented by an old woman riding on a donkey, and she has a winnowing uh, basket in her uh, hand. But in Rajasthan, the myth was, the story was that seven sisters and one brother were out in the forest one day, and they came upon an old lady who told them about a way to keep uh, healthy against smallpox and they needed to worship her by bringing water and cool things don't have a fire going you need cooling substances and beverages for her and then um, you might come down with it but you won't die and so um, so I got this to wear and all the villagers immediately know Sita Mata this representation. So they knew I was working on smallpox. I didn't have to say a word, even if I'm just walking through the village, they know that, you know, mm -hmm. and um, so it's, um, it's it was a wonderful really talisman. Yeah. So we've come to the end and I just wanted to ask, are there any final thoughts that you'd like to say? I think I said in before in the reflections on, um, mm -hmm. um, 
smallpox, how it really laid the mm -hmm. foundation for me in international public health. Um, how did it affect your daughter? You know, she didn't, it was way after her. I mean, I didn't um, adopt her until Ethiopia. Okay. In, in the Ethiopian war. So um, 1990. Okay. Um, but she's been <laughs> real interested in, you, you know, that, well, um, smallpox is in the news and you, you know you're being called by maybe you'll go to back to India mom and take me you know <laughs> to, to on this trip and stuff but um remember she was in India with me uh -huh. during um the second time around so um she does remember India uh -huh. and riding horses in the desert and um going to stay with my um guide there uh, at his ancestral home when he had retired. I think, um, you know, it was just a fluke opportunity that was given to me uh, to work in smallpox, but it was um, those people who had a vision. I mean, clearly D.A. Henderson wanted more young doctors to go into um, public health. And on a certain um, point, you know, as a clinician, you're treating one child, one case. You could treat, you had an impact when you worked on public health because there were hundreds, thousands of people that you could really make a difference on. And, and all of the work that I've done from childhood immunizations to malaria control, to yellow fever, cholera, Rift Valley, hemorrhagic fever, HIV AIDS, TB. You know, I can look back and say, I feel really good at the work that I've done that I've saved thousands and thousands of lives and trained, you know, national workers and, um, you know, have seen over the 35 years, when I first went to Afro in Brazzaville, sitting around the table of consultants, they were all white male and Connie. And over the years, they're been replaced by Africans who have been trained some of them by CDC, uh, some of them with others, but that, you know, that's the way it should be. And there were more women now when I'm ending up than when I started. So that's really good to see that um, Africans are taking care of Africans. And, um, but there's been that transfer of knowledge and information. And if you give people the resources, they can do it, you know?